It's been quite a week in Starbase. Of course, major top stick work continues as you would expect, but we also got an update from the FAA. We've seen clear indications of an imminent drop test simulation, and we're even seeing signs that Starhopper, the legendary Starhopper, might be relocated. We've got all of that and a whole lot more in your Starbase update. Let's start off at the Star Factory and the connected buildings where we were able to take a peek at the hardware of the future. Firstly, squinting through the heat haze, we saw something that appeared to be a flap storage rig moving to the building. These structures are usually used to store flaps before installation onto a ship. This move could be part of further outfitting the Star Factory as it becomes more and more operational. And of course, more operational means more flaps to store. Interestingly, it was not moved inside of the Star Factory though. It was placed right behind it and it's now sitting in the vicinity of tent number four. Inside of the Star Factory, we can see one of the two nose cones that we've been tracking. One of them is currently being outfitted with additional tiles. Some areas remain uncovered to allow for necessary access and the tip of the nose, one of the most uniquely shaped and critical parts of the hardware, has yet to be addressed. We're not entirely sure why SpaceX has placed all of these orange markers on the thermal protection system. They could be for tracking in some sort of software or perhaps notes for inspection. However, at this point it's difficult to determine their exact purpose or why they are present on certain parts of the TPS. Checking in on the other nose cone, it has not yet received any TPS and remains bare inside of the Star Factory. Both of these are V2 nose cones, so it's fascinating to observe how quickly SpaceX can produce these new hardware components. This will give us insight into how fast the V2 production line currently operates and how efficient it will be in the future. A few days later, we observed the nose cone with more tiles being placed on a rotating platform where a worker was polishing and cleaning it. This likely marks the beginning of tile installation in that delicate area. Additionally, we've noticed green labels alongside the orange ones on the tiles, suggesting that these markers could be related to inspections, if we had to make an educated guess at this point. The cleaning of the nose cone took some time, and a nice bonus of the rotating platform is that, while very convenient for the worker, it also provides us with a full 360 degree view of the entire nose cone. That's quite useful. The office and the staff factory are continuing to creep towards one another and merging together, and it appears that the final complex will be more of a unified structure than one might have originally expected. With the same height and coordinated work between them, this suggests that the site at Boca Chica will become a massive Starship mega complex, integrating both the hardware production and the planning operations for Starship into one location. There may still be a small gap leading to the yard of the office building, but the two structures are nearly connected. SpaceX is maximizing every meter of space available at Boca Chica. The entrance to the Star Factory is also taking shape, featuring a cool triangular design. This will be the main entry to the factory and will likely receive additional visual details in the coming weeks as SpaceX completes the construction. Over at the multi-story car park, we can see that some work is still needed, but that hasn't stopped SpaceX from already using it to park cars. However, it's clear that the additional parking space hasn't reduced the number of cars parked along Highway 4. There is, of course, much more work ongoing at Starbase, including the fact that it looks like every aerial work platform in Cameron County is currently at the chopsticks. But first, I want to take a moment to introduce you to our brand new collection, the Thrust Collection. This epic lineup celebrates a passion for engines, highlighting some of the most iconic works of engineering of our time. For this video, the Raptor shirt will likely catch your eye, but we've also got the designs featuring the legendary RS-25, SpaceX's Merlin, and Blue Origin's BE-4 engines. Each design is available in both full colour and grayscale, so you can choose your favourite look. Check them out at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Of course, there's hardware movement, work, and ongoing upgrades everywhere at Starbase, so let's dive in and check out all the activity, from ongoing work to the various things happening across the site. Checking in on Ship 31, we see that the ship is already quite advanced in its tile replacement process. SpaceX likely picked up some useful techniques while outfitting Ship 30 with the new heat shield, so the process appears to be moving faster for Ship 31, which is currently expected to conduct the sixth flight of Starship. Some parts of Ship 31 are 
still exposed, and we can see that workers are preparing certain areas for TPS installation. This is a common practice where they first cover the larger, simpler areas before tackling the smaller, more complex sections. The final phase includes applying TPS to the tip of the nose, weld lines and curves on the flaps. A few days later we can see that more gaps on ship 31 have been filled as additional tiles are being added, so yes, progress is definitely being made. Over at the Massey's test area, the 16th test tank is still being enclosed within the structural test stand to verify the structural integrity for the V2 ship. You can see the ropes for the structural testing being lowered from the top platform to the lower platform. These ropes will create tension once the structural test begins. They will be pulled to simulate the forces the structure will need to endure during flight. If pulled too tight for what the tank can handle, it will crush the can, which is where this apparatus gets its nickname from the can crusher. In some of the more unusual areas of work at Starbase, we noticed that SpaceX is adding a roof to Tower 1. This is the tower that has been standing for three years, and now SpaceX has decided it finally needs a roof for some reason. Additionally, it looks like they're working on the pulley system connected to the chopsticks. It's not just its roof that's seen attention this week, however, as Tower 1 is undergoing significant work in multiple areas. The carriage system at the back is also being worked on, with scaffolding extending all the way above the ship quick distance connect area. Additionally, there is substantial work being done on the chopsticks. Essentially, every section of this tower has been getting attention recently. Up at the ship quick disconnect area, more workers are on site. We saw parts being added to it last week, and it appears that this work has continued without pause. Workers are now using scaffolding right next to the QD system, indicating ongoing modifications and improvements. On top of the booster quick disconnect, we observed additional welding work, which is likely reinforcing the hood. This makes sense because this area will be highly exposed if a booster were to miss the chopsticks and come down onto the pad. It's also very close to where the booster exhaust will be directed during the catch. Therefore, it's crucial to protect this area to minimise refurbishment between flights. And as usual at Starbase, once the work is completed, it is followed by a quick test. Here you can see the booster quick disconnect in motion again after the reinforcement work. Checking in on the chopstick carriage system for Tower 2, we can see that it is still stored at the Sanchez site. This system will be attached to the second Starbase launch tower and will include the much shorter chopsticks, which are also lying next to it in the same area. And speaking of the chopsticks for Tower 2, recently one part of the carriage rail was lifted onto the tower. SpaceX is gradually preparing for the installation of the carriage system on Tower 2, but it's still a work in progress. At the base of the second launch tower, we observed piling and the installation of hardware for the foundation of the pad and flame trench. This process has taken some time as the area needs to go through preparation due to the swampy ground at Starbase. Ensuring that the foundation can withstand the forces generated during launches is a crucial step. You can see the hardware being placed rapidly next to the foundation of the launch tower. SpaceX is pushing to advance this tower as much as possible before access to the launch site is restricted due to the busy schedule leading up to the fifth flight of Starship. As I've alluded to many times throughout this video already, one of the biggest focuses right now is the chopsticks on the first Starship launch tower. SpaceX plans to attempt to catch on the next flight, which means we're seeing significant refurbishment of the chopsticks. This week brings another round of busy modifications. One of the tanks used to support the movement of the sticks during operations is undergoing a replacement and refurbishment. It appears that SpaceX has also removed a second tank from the area. The question now is why these tanks have been removed. It could be due to a need for replacement or because SpaceX plans to reinforce them, which has been a recent trend. They might be concerned about the exposed nature of these tanks as they could be easily damaged during a catch attempt. It appears that this is not just a one-off occurrence, but rather something affecting all of the tanks in the system. SpaceX is also continuing to work on the pads of the chopsticks. Sometimes these installations don't go as planned as evidenced here. While workers initially gathered around to prepare the part for installation on the chopsticks, it appears they changed their plans quickly. Just a few minutes later, the crane hooked apart it again, still attached to the pad that had not been installed. But they didn't give up. Just hours later, we saw the successful installation of another pad on the chopsticks. It might have been a minor fitting issue that was easily corrected. Of course, this is just one of many pads that need to be installed on the chopsticks. These pads are softer than the steel of the chopsticks and are designed to prevent damage to the booster during the catch attempt by absorbing and cushioning the impact. The chopsticks remain a high priority item for the preparation of Flight 5 as evidenced here. Workers are swarming the hardware and performing tasks 
tasks all over to ensure they are ready and outfitted for the catch. From what we can tell, there is still a significant amount of work to be done before they can support any testing or catching operations. The Wilds also received more attention this week, with additional protective shielding being installed on top of them. This continues the ongoing work from what we discussed last week. Late at night, SpaceX tested the deployment of the landing rail for the chopsticks. This rail will serve as the contact point for the landing pins of the booster. You can see it extending upwards in the middle of the night. Alongside the landing rail test, workers are inspecting the movement of the rails as they operate. The padding on the chopsticks is progressing quickly. Five of the pads are already installed on the left side, and additional frames are being prepared to attach more pads soon. On the other chopstick, work is a little bit further behind. So far, only the frames have been installed, with the pads yet to be added. However, pad installation tends to proceed quickly once the frames are in place. One proof of that pace, instead of five pads a day later, there are now eight installed, with the ninth almost complete as well. And just on the same day, we saw a second landing rail test. And just this Saturday, they installed the final pads on the chopsticks, making great progress over the weekend. It'll certainly be interesting to see how the padding will interact with the Super Heavy booster as it comes into land. In addition to all of this, we also see sharp reinforcement plates being installed on some parts of the chopsticks. This adds another layer of protection to the more vulnerable areas of the sticks. By the end of the week, you can see that they have almost completed the padding work on the chopsticks. Only a few pads at the very tip remain before that chopstick is fully equipped. We're approaching the next step in preparing the chopsticks for Flight 5 and getting a clear idea of what the final setup might look like. Booster 14.1, the little test tank that likes getting slapped by the chopsticks, recently had additional crane lifting points installed, which is quite intriguing. This recent addition makes it increasingly clear what might be planned for this tank. Once the chopsticks are ready to simulate a catch, the leading theory is that a crane will lift B14.1 and then drop it onto the chopsticks for a quick drop test. This will be an impressive test, though it does come with some risk. We're hoping there will be a road closure to provide ample warning and allow us to cover the event thoroughly. In any case, this is yet another example of why having notifications enabled is a good idea. We literally do not know when this could happen. Of course, all of this chopstick work is for nothing if there aren't any vehicles to launch, so let's check in with Ship 30, which saw some activity over the week. In case you've forgotten, this is the ship scheduled for the next Starship flight test and is currently stored in the Rocket Garden since most of the work on it is complete. However, some work still seems to be ongoing. You can see an aerial work platform positioned next to it, with workers inspecting something inside of the payload section. While the exact details remain unclear, it's worth noting that the hatch to the payload section is open, given that it's the next flight vehicle. You can see at least one worker right at the entry of the hatch, appearing to communicate with more personnel inside of the payload section. It doesn't seem to be a lengthy inspection, as SpaceX usually brings in ventilation hoses if workers are inside for extended periods or performing tasks like welding. Since this is the payload hatch, it could be in preparation for the installation of a test payload for the next flight, should SpaceX decide to include one. Besides that, Ship 30 is simply enjoying its time in the Rocket Garden, alongside Ship 26 and others, as it awaits the completion of other items on the flight preparation checklist before the flight can commence. This next item might make a few of you nervous. We're seeing some early indications that Starhopper might be moving and technically leaving the launch site. SpaceX has scheduled a road closure for Wednesday morning, which has sparked some interest. The road closure notice mentions a one hour movement from the launch pad to the SpaceX parking lot. Given that Mary spotted some work below Starhopper and the scheduled road closure for its relocation, it seems SpaceX might be moving Starhopper to a parking lot, and this could very well be the lot right next to the launch pad, which has become affectionately known as the Danger Lot. This is where SpaceX allows us to set up remote cameras and live stream equipment for launch day, so it'll be interesting to see what that'll look like in the future. Here you can see a few workers with a scissor lift underneath Starhopper, seemingly inspecting something. This is one of the indicators suggesting that a move might be imminent. But why? Firstly, SpaceX might need the area Starhopper is currently residing in for the planned tank farm expansion. Secondly, since Starhopper endures a lot of wear and tear with each Starship launch, moving it further from the launch pad could help preserve it better. Of course, we hope this move is to preserve Starhopper rather than to scrap it. SpaceX has previously featured Starhopper in renders of the full launch site, indicating that the company acknowledges its historic significance and the community's affection for it. However, it's worth noting that SpaceX has, in the past, 
scrapped the first Starship to successfully land SN15 without hesitation. We will make sure to cover all of the steps of this potential Starhopper movement and keep you updated no matter what. In addition to all the hardware updates, we need to discuss a recent update from the Federal Aviation Administration that was sent to NSF earlier this week. In this update, the FAA confirms that they are evaluating SpaceX's proposed license modification for its Starship Flight 5 mission. SpaceX must meet all its safety, environmental and other licensing requirements before receiving FAA authorization. The timeline will be driven by safety considerations. This update confirms a few things. First, SpaceX is indeed laying the regulatory groundwork for a catch attempt. In theory, SpaceX would not need to modify the launch license if they decide against a catch on the next flight. The current license covers similar flights, hardware and trajectories as previous flights. However, a catch attempt is not included in the current license, so if SpaceX wants to incorporate it into Flight 5, they will need a modification. This also confirms that SpaceX has already proposed this change to the FAA, and the FAA is now reviewing the steps and requirements that SpaceX must meet for the modification. So there you have it, an update. Of course, alongside this, SpaceX needs to complete all of the chopstick refurbishment work, conduct the B-14.1 testing they are aiming for, stack both vehicles on the launch pad, perform a wet dress rehearsal, and then install the flight termination system, and then launch. So there's quite a lot to do on the hardware side as well. We're not ready to launch in a few days. It's not the FAA holding SpaceX up. There is a lot of hardware work to do. With all of that being said, it looks like the flight is getting closer to the October window. While we lack a crystal ball, it seems that September might be a bit optimistic for Flight 5 of Starship. We will, of course, stand by and see what happens over the next few weeks and how quickly they get everything ready. Are you excited about the potential upcoming drop test of B-14.1? Will it succeed or will the test reveal that SpaceX's hardware needs more refinement before a catch attempt? Let us know your thoughts. I've been Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.